We've already seen a few examples of how to find the volume of an object by integrating. And if you recall, in general we found that if you can divide an object into thin slices, and each thin slice has a cross-sectional area that you can find, we can find the volume by integrating that area function from one end of the object to the other. That's what we have in this general formula, that volume is the integral of the area function. In this section, we're going to start dealing with a specific class of geometric objects, and that's ones that have some symmetry, and specifically rotational symmetry. Now what do we mean by that? I have two examples here of rotationally symmetric objects. One is a baseball bat, and the other is a glass or a cup. Now if you think about the baseball bat, this thing has a shape to the outside, which is mostly something like a straight line, and then that shape gets revolved around, in this case the way I've drawn it, it gets revolved around the x-axis, because I've drawn it horizontally, and that forms this solid object. If you think about how these objects are made, like baseball bats for instance, you put a solid block of wood on a lathe, and as it spins, you cut away material to leave behind this profile. And you could spin that bat, and it wouldn't look any different as you spin it. The profile would stay the same if you spun it around the x-axis the way that we've drawn it. In the same way, I've drawn a cup, or I haven't drawn it, but I have a picture of a cup that is oriented so that it's rotationally symmetric around the y-axis, meaning if you spin this thing in this direction, the profile wouldn't change at all. We would see the same picture as you continue to rotate it. So that's the idea of the rotational symmetry. And these objects occur all around us, and they're one category of object that we can deal with relatively easily using this volume formula. If you remember, earlier when we did examples with finding the volume by integrating, we had to jump through a lot of hoops usually to find that cross-sectional area function. It turns out with these rotationally symmetric things, that's a lot easier because the cross-sectional areas, the cross-sections when we cut across it, are circular. So just like we've done before, when we slice this thing, we're going to slice it across one of the axes. We're going to slice it across the axis of symmetry. So in this case, if it's symmetric around the x-axis, we'll slice it perpendicular to that. Or if it's symmetric across the y-axis, we'll split it into sections horizontally. Now if you think about what happens when you split one of these, if you slice a thin section of the bat, what you'll see when you pull that out and you look at it, you'll see a small disk. So it's a circular disk with a thickness of delta x. And the area of it is going to be the area of a circle. Now of course at different points if we sliced it down here versus up at the other end, the area will be different, but both of them will be circles. And it just depends on the radius at whatever point we slice it. So think about how we'll have the radius of this disk, and the area function will just equal pi times r squared. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But think on the other hand about slicing the cup at some y value. Now when we slice through this, there's some hollow space in the middle. So what you actually see when you slice this is a disk with some area cut out from the middle. So there's filled in area here and then empty space in between. So it's kind of like a donut but with squared off sides. So we generally call this a washer. So this is an example of a disk, and this is an example 
of a washer. So if there's empty space in the middle, it's a washer. If there's solid material all the way through, that's a disc. So a wooden baseball bat at least has material all the way through, so it's solid. But if it were a metal baseball bat, for instance, it would have hollow space in the middle. So it would be more like washers when you slice it into uh, thin slices. So in this case, the washer, not only is it different because it's a washer, but also the thickness in this case is a small change in y. So we have a delta y instead of delta x. And that's specifically because of the direction of rotation. The bat, at least the way we've drawn it, is symmetric about the x-axis. That's the way that it spins if we're drawing it symmetrically. Same thing with the cup. It's oriented about the y-axis, and that's the direction or the orientation of its symmetry. So it's important to recognize that whichever way you slice this thing, you're going to slice it across the axis of symmetry. You're going to slice through it so that your cross sections are all consistent and they're all circles. So in this case with a washer, you can think about the volume of this thing, or more specifically the cross sectional area. The area is now going to be a function of y in this case, because everything's in terms of y, and that area depends on now the y value where we slice it, not the x value where we slice it. And the volume, or the cross-sectional area specifically, of this washer is going to be the area of the outer disk, and then imagine cutting out the inner circle, and so it's the outer area minus the inner area. So the outer area is, let's call this capital R squared, where the capital R is the radius out to the outer edge. And then the inner one would be pi. Let's use little r to represent the radius to the inner edge. So all we need to know is those two radii, and our area function is given to us. So with these volume functions, there's a couple of variations that you'll need to keep track of as you're looking at different problems. Some of them will be drawn where your rotation axis will be x, and so the integral will be in terms of x. Other ones will be drawn vertically and rotated around the y-axis or some other vertical line, and you'll integrate with respect to y. Also, you need to watch out whether they're disks or washers. If it's disks, you just have one radius to find. If it's washers, you have two. So we're kind of drilling down on these problems. In general, a volume problem boils down to finding the area function. And with these rotationally symmetric ones, finding the area function boils down to finding a radius or two values for radius. So we're kind of specifically honing in on the exact part of the problem that we need to deal with. All right, let's see a couple examples. And I'm going to do two examples side by side, one using disks and one using washers, so that we can observe the differences. But both of these examples are going to be integrals in terms of x, so that part will be consistent from one to the other, but recognize that we're going to deal with y in a few examples as we go forward. But for now, we'll stick to integrals with respect to x. So over here on the left, we're going to take a function y equals x, a really simple straight line, and we'll revolve that around the x-axis. Between x equals 0 and x equals 2. And we'll draw that picture in just a second. On the right-hand side, our example will be the region bounded by two functions, y equals 2 minus 1 half x, and y equals 1, and then between x equals 1 and 2. And we'll take that region and revolve that around the x-axis. So on the left here, 
our picture looks more or less like this. And I've just drawn the segment of y equals x between 0 and 2. Now we take that straight line and we revolve that around the x-axis. So what we end up with is something that looks like this. Basically a cone laid on its side. So a straight line when we revolve that around the x-axis we get a cone. And the volume inside is completely solid. There's no holes in the middle. So when we think about cutting out slices of this, slices will be solid disks like this. On the right hand side, the line y equals 1, that's pretty easy, that's a straight line, a horizontal line. The line y equals 2 minus 1 half x, that starts up here at 2 and comes down like this, has an x-intercept of 4, and then we're going from x equals 1 to x equals 2. So this region right here is what we're interested in. It's the region bounded by these two lines, and then x equals 1 on the left, x equals 2 on the right. So when you revolve this around the x-axis, what you end up with is this upper line rotates down like this. And then here, that's more or less what it looks like. So maybe hard to visualize, but it looks like a truncated cone on the outside, and then on the inside there's been a core kind of drilled out of it. So it's like if you took a cone, chopped off part of it, the top, and then drilled straight through it. Um, or maybe a ring where one edge is sharp here, and one edge has a flat side to it. So that's the general structure. Now hopefully you can see that when we slice across this, the slices will look like washers. So I'll draw the slice over here to the side so it doesn't clutter up the picture anymore, but that's what our slices will look like. And we'll have to figure out the two values for radius, the inner and outer radius. So it's always helpful with these volume ones to draw a picture and to think about the general slice what it looks like whether it's a disc or a washer and which way it's oriented so both of these are oriented vertically meaning they have a thickness delta x so our integrals will both be with respect to x and the one on the left is a disc the one on the right is a washer so on the left here our area function is just going to equal pi times r squared and on the right our area function is going to be pi times the bigger radius squared minus pi times the little radius squared. So the area of the big disk, the full one, minus the area of the part that's chopped out of the middle. Now we get to actually finding these radii, the radius on the left and the two values for the radius on the right. So here's the key to finding radius. The radius of these is just the distance from the center to the outer edge. Okay, now that sounds kind of simplistic because that's just what radius means with a circle in general. But it's helpful to think in terms of this because we just need to find what's the center and what's the outer edge. What defines each of those pieces? So on the left, the center is the x-axis, which is the line y equals 0. The outer edge is the line y equals x. 
So the distance between those two is just the difference. When you subtract one from the other, you find the distance between them. So the distance between y equals 0 and y equals x, if we subtract them, the radius is just x minus 0. Or we can just write x. So once you see that, this gets a lot simpler. It's hard at first to recognize these values for the radius, but just think carefully, what's the center of my picture? What's the line that they're rotated around? And then what defines the edge? So on the right hand side we have two radius values to worry about, but the center will be the same for both of them. Again the center is the x-axis, or y equals zero. Later on we're going to do examples where we rotate around another horizontal line, and it really doesn't change much, we just would then write y equals whatever the value of that line is. So if it's up at y equals two, we write y equals two, and so on. In this case, we have the outer edge, so this is going to be for our capital R. That's defined by this line y equals 2 minus 1 half x. And then the inner edge is defined by the line y equals 1. Which means that the inner radius is just 1 minus 0. And that kind of makes sense. As you look across this picture, the inner radius stays consistent the whole way. That's always just 1. It's the outer radius that's changing for different values of x. So in this case, the inner radius is 1 minus 0, or just 1. The outer radius is 2 minus 1 half x minus 0, or 2 minus 1 half x. And again, I'm, I'm staying in the habit of writing this minus zero, even though you might want to drop it off just for simplicity, but it's good to stay in the habit of that because you'll see ones later on where we rotate around a different line, and if you're so used to rotating around the x-axis that you can't shift the problem to something else, uh, you'll miss those problems. So we have our values for radius in each case, which means here on the left, our area function is going to be pi times x squared, because r just equals x. Here on the right, our area function will be pi times capital R squared minus pi times 1 squared. Because we found that little r was 1 and big R was 2 minus 1 half x. At this point, all the hard work is done for us, and the volume for each one is just going to be the integral of the area function. The only thing we have to worry about in setting up this integral now is the limits of integration. Let me pull pi out of this integral first. And then we can go back and look at limits of integration. But again, as long as you've drawn your picture carefully, the limits of integration usually aren't that hard. On the left side, we have this cone, and we're told specifically we're working between x equals 0 and x equals 2. So since our integral is with respect to x, we're looking for bounds of x, and we naturally choose the left side is x equals 0, the right side is x equals 2. So that's not too hard. On the right side, looking at these washers, Again, we're given x values. x equals 1 on the left, x equals 2 on the right, so we're given the bounds on the left and right sides of this picture. So our limits are from 1 to 2. And then you can go through and integrate each case. On the left hand side, this becomes pi over 3 x cubed from 0 to 2, which works out to 8 pi over 3. On the right hand side, the easiest thing to do rather than worrying about u substitution or something would be just to multiply out 2 minus 1 half x, expand out that square. So you would get 4 minus 2x plus 1 fourth x squared minus 1. And then I'll leave out some details just for the sake of time. 
what you should get at the end is 7 pi over 12. Notice that you often end up with pi in these answers unless it cancels for some strange reason uh, because we're dealing with rotationally symmetric things. So we'll do more examples of these, but the details will change, but the overall structure stays the same. You'll either have disks or washers with these rotationally symmetric things, and you need to think about what are the values of the radius, which is just the distance between the center and one of the edges. And then once you have that, you just need to find your limits of integration, and the integrals tend to be just that simple.